everybody. Welcome to our program. Uh, this is the Immigration Acts of 1921 and 1924 and how they changed Cleveland. Um, it's a program that's co-sponsored by Case Western Reserve University Siegel Lifelong Learning, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, Cleveland.com, The Plain Dealer, and our corporate sponsor is First Interstate Properties Limited. Our speaker this evening is John J. Grabowski, who holds a joint position in, at, as the Krieger Mueller Associate Professor of Applied History at Case Western Reserve University, and the Krieger Mueller Chief Historian and Senior VP for Research and Publications at the Western Reserve Historical Society. He also serves as the editor of the online edition of the Encyclopedia of Cleveland History and the D Dictionary of Cleveland Biography. He also has written numerous articles relating to immigration history and to archival issues. Dr. Grabowski received his BA, MA, and PhD degrees in history from Case Western Reserve University, and he's a member of Phi Beta Kappa. Dr. Grabowski. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's appropriate because the uh, Quota Act of number 1921 is known as the Emergency Quota Act, and my trip down here was somewhat of an emergency. I parked on the campus, looked at the right rear tire, it was almost flat. I decided it was time to drive home up on Overlook Road, park the car in the garage, and then to come down. So I've just done 0.7 miles in eight minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to start off by saying, obviously, this is a timely talk. Uh, every time I speak of immigration, which was my training field as a historian uh, when I was studying Case Western Reserve, uh, it, is, it is a topical issue. And, and we're talking about a number of things today. I don't want to get deeply into politics. Uh, there will be parallels that we'll be seeing. There will be questions afterward, and I can venture that way. Uh, but we're actually looking at the first major overall limitation of immigration to the United States, which took place in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, Michael and I have debated various titles for this, and I decided to uh, call this Within the Quota and Without the Quota, examining the Immigration Acts of 1921 and 1924. And I've done so for a particular reason. Um, this is 1923, it's Paris. This is a ballet. And it's the only ballet that was, the music for which was written by Cole Porter, who was an expatriate in Paris at that point. And he, along with another expatriate, Gerald Murphy, who was the heir to the cross leather fortune, uh, Murphy did the book. So this is an actual image from the stage, and it was called Within the Quota. And the synopsis of this is, is an immigrant lands in America and meets success, successively a variety of American types, part real, part mythical, with whom he is already familiar through visits to the cinema. His pleasure in the company of an heiress, a strutting vaudevillian, a jazz baby, and a cowboy is interrupted by repeated appearances of an American Puritan, who is depicted in turn as a social reformer, reform agent, uplifter, and sheriff. Finally, he meets the sweetheart of the world, a Mary Pickford-type character who embraces him and to the accompaniment of clicking cameras oversees his metamorphosis from raw immigrant to movie star. Now, the title of this obviously was drawn from the Emergency Quota Act, which had passed in 1921, and so Murphy and Cole Porter were examining that. And fast forward to another Ivy League school. Cole Porter was from Yale. This is uh, Princeton in 2017, and they have reprised within the quota. And one might wonder why they decided to reprise it in 2017, and I will leave that wonderment to you. Uh, there is a lot on the web about the revival of this. By the way, Porter's music was thought to be lost, and it was finally found in an archive at Yale in uh, 1970. Uh, I was tempted to show you the film, but I can go on long enough without AV. Let's do a background. My my intention is to talk about the quotas and to speculate in sort of counterfactual history. What might have happened in Cleveland if the quotas hadn't been passed? We could spend a lot of time debating that. Uh, but we need to put this particular piece of legislation in the broader history of American immigration and also in the broader history of laws relating to American immigration. So these are the raw numbers. And I just take this up to 1965 because 1965 we'll get to at the end. 
that is when base, what is the basis of our current immigration law is passed. So you're looking at small numbers really in the years just after the revolution, uh, but the big move predominantly from Western and Northern Europe begins in 1820 and 1860, five million people. Some historians, Roger Daniels argues that that's probably the largest European migration out to the Americas in history at that point. From 1961 to 1924, this is the period that's critical for us, it's 32 million people arriving in the United States. And so this sets up this move to limit and uh, regulate immigration. And then under the quota acts and restriction, and you have to remember that parked in this time period, A, a depression, and B, a major war that are going to retard immigration either, even further. So that's the, that's the overview in numbers. When we look at percentages, and this is one of the things that we look at today, what percentage of foreign born are there in the United States? What percentage before are we more foreign born now than before? You can do the numbers here, and I've decided to run it against New York City. I'll give you Cleveland later on, so we can look at that. You can remember this particular image. And, and you'll notice that, that major cities like New York, Port City, are always above the average in percentage of foreign born. But the numbers in the United States are pretty steady. Uh, from the 1860s up into 1890, when they jump again to 14%, and then in 1920, just before the quota, they're at 13.2%. And by 1950, uh, with restriction, they've dropped to 6.9%. I believe by 1970, the number is 5.9% foreign born. Right now, we are looking at about 13 to 14% in the United States in terms of foreign born which is the effect of the recent Immigration Act. You'll notice how well New York holds on to that, but it still declines. Interestingly enough, and some of you may know this, that the federal government did not have control of immigration until really 1882. Uh, really, there was a law, a, a court case in 1872 that challenged the state's rights to govern immigration. The states actually regulated immigration to port states. And what the states did was charge a, a tax on every immigrant coming in to defray what we would now call welfare costs. And that began to look like a tariff on foreign commerce, which then constitutionally belonged to the federal government. And the case booted immigration to, let me move this out of here, booted immigration to the federal government, but the federal government actually did not take control of it until 1882. So what we're looking at here is, uh, this is New York, this is the tip of the battery, this is pre-Ellis Island, this is Castle Garden, which was administered by the state of New York and then administered after 1882 by the, uh, by the federal government. And, and there are all sorts of things you can read here, labor exchange, Arbeiter Bureau, you notice that German is the second language here, uh, labor exchange, labor exchange. So all the touts, all the businesses were there uh, working or preying upon the immigrants as, as they got off the ship. Now, remember, I'm going to be talking a lot about New York, but we're essentially we're looking at almost all the major ports in the United States would absorb immigrants. Boston, Providence, Rhode Island would absorb immigrants. Galveston, New Mexico, uh, many immigrants came through Philadelphia, but our focus has always been on New York, that primary port. Now, I would say here, if we're looking at a limiter on immigration, it's the fact that when immigration is driven by ship, it has to go through a port city in order to do mass immigration. So if we're looking at open land borders, there's another issue here. So I just want to tease you with some things that are going on. Not that ships don't offload illegally. Not that ships don't come into major ports. When the government takes over, we begin to regulate immigration slowly. Uh, 1882 is the Chinese Exclusion Act, and I, I wander a lot, that's why I work with the lapel mic. And uh, this is a cartoon basically saying the only one barred out, enlightened American statesman, we must draw the line somewhere you know. And there's a, the gate of liberty is closed to the Chinese, but notice communist, nihilist, socialist, Fenian, hoodlum, welcome, but no admission to Chinaman. And this is coming out of pressure on the West Coast, where the Chinese had begun arriving in 1849 for the gold rush. And by the 1870s and 1880s, huge amount of anti-Chinese discrimination and a worry that the Chinese were a labor force that could undercut any American worker. And notwithstanding, the Chinese were also not white and they were also not Christian. 
And so the labor parties in in California pushed this, this move to ban the Chinese and the, gov the United States government started the Chinese Exclusion Act which would be renewed every 10 years until the 1940s to the detriment of a long-standing treaty with China called the Burlingame Treaty. So we actually abrogated part of our treaty responsibilities in moving toward this popular sentiment that the Chinese could not be assimilated, the Chinese could never become Americans, the Chinese were unfair workers. Uh, now, there are a lot of loopholes in that act, and that's another lecture, and if I'm invited back, maybe we could do that. Uh, but once you begin, then you get 1882, those likely to become a public charge. And so the laws over time will require that immigrants landing have a certain amount of cash in their pockets. Now, you'll see that percentage. It's a quarter. It's 25 cents initially, uh, but it will go up. 1891, polygamists and people with loathsome and contagious, dangerous contagious diseases. And polygamists, you have to wonder why. Mormons. The Mormons were recruiting greatly in England, and Mormons were coming over to populate, move out to Utah, and there was an anti-Mormon feeling at that point, very strong. So the Mormons are out. Contagious and loathsome diseases, uh, uh, one that you'll probably know, most people know the Ellis Island lore, the trachoma, the eye disease, the button hook examination. Uh, that did not keep that many people out. We can talk about that later. 1903, other things were added. Anarchists, saboteurs, epileptics, and beggars. Now, the question I've always had, and I have to look more deeply into the literature, is how did they know, without the benefit of the internet and sophisticated surveillance, that somebody was a saboteur or an anarchist? Now, the anarchists in the 1890s were the terrorists of the time. There were four major international assassinations. One in Italy, uh, King Umberto, who was murdered by an Italian anarchist who lived in Patterson, New Jersey, and went back. Uh, the Empress of Austria was murdered, and the Premier of France was murdered. And in 1901, a would-be wannabe anarchist named Leon Scholgush from Cleveland, Ohio, assassinated William McKinley in Buffalo. So this was basically terrorism and closing the door on terrorism. Uh, beggars, I don't know, OK? <laughs> This is a more efficient door. This, this is, uh, I, I do another talk in this, and I'm always amazed uh, when people in the 1920s, when these two quota acts were passed, if you had told them that Ellis Island, which was the source of these people, would have become a national museum to immigration, uh, they would have been somewhat stunned. But nevertheless, Ellis Island, oh, the island of tears, relatively few people were turned back. Three to five percent of those coming through Ellis were turned back. And a lot of that was due to the fact that the shipping companies who really drove the immigrant chain in the 1880s, 90s, and early 1900s, larger and faster ships, the Germans competing with the English, competing with the French, competing with the Dutch to get the immigrant trade, they knew that if somebody were turned back in the United States, it would be on their ticket that they would have to bring them back. So they actually did inspections at ports. So they knew people would be viable passengers. So that was going on at that point. Numbers, oh God, I'll bore you all to death. I won't read these out to you, but you will notice uh, these are legal permanent residents entering by year. So this is every port in the United States and people coming over the northern and southern borders. But you'll notice how the numbers are climbing. 1905, they, they go over a million for the first time. And we're looking at a nation of about 100 million people. And, and then in 1907, they go to 1.2 million. You notice that they drop for these two years. Immigrants are smart. They knew that there was an economic, not collapse, hiccup problem. It was this crisis, the gold crisis in 1907. We were bailed out. The federal government was bailed out by J.P. Morgan. So that drove the numbers down. And then you see them coming back up again. In 1914, the year before the First World War, it's 1.2 million. And you notice what the war does to immigration. And 1919, things are still unsettled. More about that later. 1920, the numbers begin to jump up. 1921, they're up to 18. And that is why you see the Emergency Act come up, because the numbers are coming up again. But there's something in between this. And you notice as they're passed, the numbers are rising 
23, 24, and then they begin to drop. Now, again, what we will see is that there are certain numbers at Ellis Island that are different because this is not simply Ellis Island. But 1931, with the Great Depression, Global Depression, on, it's 97,000 immigrants. And actually, if you look at the immigration numbers in the United States between 1930 and 1940, there's a net loss of immigrants and people going back. That's one of the things we have to understand is immigrants were transient. I'll talk a bit about that later, going back and forth. And that troubled some of the people observing this phenomenon, i.e., if you're coming to America, you are coming for freedom and assimilation, not simply to make a buck and go home. My words. This is Ellis Island. I forget which website I picked this up. But this, this, there are two things to notice here. One, what the top groups are, and two, that you notice initially it's Germany, Germany, Ireland, Ireland, and then Italy, Italy, and then Italian, Jewish, Polish, German, Scandinavian. Initially, immigrants were ranked, and if you've done your family genealogy and you've looked at records, they, they, were, they were counted by their homeland. So it didn't matter if you were Slovak, Slovenian, or Magyar, if you came from Austria-Hungary, you came from Austria-Hungary. Then they began to discern that there were different nationalities, ethnic groups within. And this is really nice for us as genealogists, or for me who studies Turks coming to the United States. People coming from Turkey were Armenian, Greek, and some Turks and Kurds. Uh, but this evolving science of, of race, science, quote unquote, popular science, if you will, and how people can be categorized by who they are. But look at the shift. Italian, Jewish, Jewish, Polish. You'll notice that Northern and Eastern Western Europeans, there's still some English in, but you're looking at Southern and Eastern Europe. And we're looking at these factors that drive immigration, the push factors that push people out, and the pull factors that pull them up. So as economies in Northern and Western European countries became more robust and families were more limited in size, Fewer people emigrated. And then as factors that, be, that changed economics and wars moved into Central, Southern, and Eastern Europe, more people were pushed out. Most of the Italians are coming from the Mezzogiorno, the southern part of Italy, where there's incredible poverty. They're, they're fleeing poverty. They're fleeing Mount Etna. They're fleeing other natural disasters. Look, look at the changes here, 15, 16, Italian still, 18, English, English, French, and 20, Italian, Italian, 22, Jewish, and then once you get the new quota in, German, English, Scottish. We're going to go into that. So this is what the quota acts do. This is the preview. The quota acts do not simply limit immigration overall to a certain number per year. They stack it in a way. They, they, they assign quotas by your nationality. And the preferential quotas are engineered for Northern and Western Europeans. This is, uh, where, this is the starting point for a lot of this legislation. <laughs> Let's get out of the way here. If I get any further out of the way, I'm over the edge. In 1894, in Boston, three Harvard graduates, uh, whom you will meet in the next image, started something called the Immigration Restriction League. And they were all Boston Brahmins. And the name of this association shall be the Immigration Restriction League. Uh, it is not the object of this league to advocate the exclusion of laborers or other immigrants of such character and standards as fit them to become citizens. Okay, uh, the, basically, they're, they're limiting the further exclusion of elements undesirable for citizenship or injurious to our national character. And, and so this all melds with this racial science that's going on and, and this fear that the founders, the Anglo-Saxons and so forth, the, of, of the United States are being overwhelmed by these new immigrants, and that the new immigrants really don't want to become citizens, and the new immigrants do not want to learn English, and the new immigrants are too clannish to be assimilated. So there's a lot moving in this. I love this cartoon. There's a wonderful article in the Boston Globe that ran uh, last year, actually, uh, no, 1917, 2017, uh, about the Immigration Restriction League, and I've drawn a lot from it. It's quite a good article. These are the founders, Prescott Farnsworth Hall, Charles Warren, Robert de Courcy Ward. Robert de Courcy Ward was a lawyer, but he was also a climatologist. This, Farnsworth Hall was the leader of the group. This was his passion. 
And what they wanted to do was find a way that you could legislate some sort of control over immigration and a control that would weed out the people who were undesirable. And so the first gambit they came up with was a literacy test. That is that people entering the United States would have to be able initially to read and write X number of words in their own language. The assumption here being that people in Central, Southern, Eastern Europe, Europe were not literate, poorly schooled, and would be weeded out by this. As a matter of fact, Hall was able to go to Ellis Island in 1895, three years after it opened, and he watched the people coming in. He had these suppositions when he saw the Eastern and Southern Europeans coming in. They're darker skin, they're dressed differently, uh, they seem to be absolutely alien to what was going on in the United States. So that's what the impetus was. Uh, there wasn't an overall number, it was simply keeping the undesirable elements, their words, not mine, out. And they had a champion, uh, the head of the Immigration Committee in the Congress was none other than Henry Cabot Lodge. Now, I have to be kind on Henry Cabot because he was a historian, he was trained at Harvard, and uh, his mentor was Henry Adams. Uh, but Lodge was one of the go-to people, and what the, th the Immigration Restriction League did is it, it acquired more acolytes and, and it lobbied, consistently lobbied both the Senate and the House of Representatives to create and pass this law to restrict immigration. Now, while all this is going on, something else is happening, which is very important. In 1906, we create what is now Homeland Security, but then the Immigration and Naturalization Service, because there's, there's, there's a little wheel in this, that, that letting people into the country was one thing, giving them their citizenship, getting them through the court system was another. And this law required that people would get their citizenship through federal courts, not through any court in the land. So this gives overall federal court control. And they also wanted to begin enforcing something called uh, aliens ineligible for citizenship. Now, the, the, the first naturalization law of 1790 says citizenship is available to white males. And that's the way it runs until after the Civil War when citizenship becomes available to people of African descent. When immigration begins to move in from Asia, and from Asian, Central Asian countries, India, for example, the question is, are they white or are they black? And they're neither. So they begin to be ruled as aliens ineligible for citizenship. There's a whole literature on this. It's a wonderful case. Well, it's not wonderful. It's an interesting case of a man who was a Sikh, uh, immigrates, and he applies for citizenship, and he says, they, they basically say, you can't, you're not white, and you're not black, and he takes them to court, and he brings in ethnographic specialists, and they say, well, you know, Asian Indians are members of the Aryan race, he should be a citizen, Aryans are cool, okay? Uh, and, and essentially, the judge rules, no, you can't, because when people see you on the street, you're an Asian. That's essentially my parsing of a difficult case. So there's another thing going on here. This becomes dicey in 1907. This is the Gentleman's Agreement. This is called Personal Presidential Diplomacy. 1905, the Japanese have just defeated the Russian Empire. Um, they are people of Asian descent, Asian background, who are to be reckoned with. Uh, the peace treaty is engineered by Theodore Roosevelt in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. He, brings the two, he gets the Nobel Peace Prize for this. The Japanese have a strong sense of pride, and they know what's happened to the Chinese. And they find out that in San Francisco, the schools are segregating against Japanese. They're moving them to separate schools, and, and they, they have a problem. They bring this to the attention of the United States government. And so Roosevelt negotiates a deal in which he convinces California to desegregate the schools, and then the Japanese government takes it upon itself not to issue passports to male Japanese workers going to the United States. That's called the Gentleman's Agreement. So that's another aspect of what some people at the time called the Yellow Peril. In 1907 to 1911, you still with me? William Dillingham, Vermont Senator, is put in charge of a committee to study immigration the immigration issues in the United States, and they issue 42, vo I think it's a 42 volume report. Uh, they study immigration, this is the committee, 
This is part of the report, the Dictionary of Races or Peoples. And, and it's, it's very interesting reading. You can find it online. There's, a, there's an accessible copy online. But they categorize all these, these immigrant, immigrant races and groups. And, and they, they, they take Italians apart, and Calabrians and so forth. They, they, they look at this. Uh, the report is issued, and what the report says is exactly what Farnsworth Hall and other people would have wanted it to say. And that is that the new immigration, their term, coming from Central, Southern, Eastern Europe, is different from the old immigration. The new immigration is more largely single male. The new immigration is more transient. They don't come to stay. The new immigration does not have the family values, does not have the educational background of the old immigration from Northern and Western Europe. So they compiled this incredible set of reports. There's a volume that devotes a lot of study to Cleveland. And it's really kind of a good picture, if you will, of what's going on. So the ammunition is piling up. Then in uh, 1916, somebody who has befriended Farnsworth Hall and becomes active in the Immigration Restriction League, a man named Madison Grant, uh, writes a book called The Passing of the Great Race. Grant's book sells about 15,000 copies, but it's influential. And, uh, and I think you can read this as well as I can read it for you, where I've redlined it. But essentially, he's looking at eugenics and inherited characteristics and making suppositions and rulings about if uh, this, the, the cross between a white man and an Indian is an Indian, the cross between a white man and a Negro and it's a Negro, the cross between a white man and a Hindu is a Hindu, and the cross between any of the three, Europe, any of the three European races, Nordic, Alpine, and Mediterranean, and a Jew is a Jew. And so he, they're, they're looking at eugenics. They're looking at sterilization, things that are going to roll about in the 1920s. Cold Harbor uh, basically does eugenics work. It has changed since then. Uh, the other one I'll read too because it is uh, the result of unlimited immigration is showing plainly in the rapid decline in the birth rate of Native Americans, not Native Americans as an indigenous people. Uh, because the poorer classes of colonial stock, where they still exist, will not bring children into the world to compete in the labor market with the Slovak, the Italian, the Syrian, and the Jew. The Native American is too proud to mix socially with them and is gradually withdrawing from the scene, abandoning to these aliens the land which he conquered and developed. The man of the old stock is being crowded out of many country districts by these foreigners, just as he is today, being literally driven off the streets of New York by the swarms of Polish Jews. Now, that's extreme, and not everybody thinks this way, but this is the literature that's being generated at this point. So the literacy test. Um, this is the, uh, the Americanese wall, not the Chinese wall, the Americanese wall. And you notice that there are pens sticking out of it, the land of the free. Uh, Uncle Sam, you're welcome in, but if you, if you can climb it. So it's kind of, you, there's, an ant, there's a pushback on what's going on. So the law is defeated in Congress first time in 1897. In 1912, you can read it, it's passed and is vetoed by President Taft. He regrets having to veto it, and we'll talk about why the vetoes are there. In 1915, it's passed and then it's vetoed by President Wilson, who thinks that reading and writing are not the characters. They've actually changed the law. It's just simply reading 40 words in the language that you're familiar with. That's what, that's what it is. Uh, but the pressures here, there is an immigrant lobby. That, that is pushing against this law. But the biggest push against the law is from major industries that need immigrants to run the factories as unskilled labor. So they're looking at a labor force coming over. And so there's always this pushback of major industry against this law. In 1917, it's passed over Wilson's veto, and it becomes the law of the land. Um, and, and and these are both Democrats and Republicans passing this over Wilson's veto. And we're not going to parse this by party at all. Uh, and this is happening in 1917. It comes, up, uh, it comes up just when the Germans resume unrestricted submarine warfare. So this is all rolled into the xenophobia that is coming up during the First World War period. So what does it do? Well, several things. It, uh, it raises the head tax to $8 a person, which is substantial. And, uh, and it also basically creates the Asiatic barred zone. 
from which all immigration will be restricted. And there's, there's the map which I stole from Wikipedia, okay? Uh, but you, you notice there's part of China there and Japan is out of it, but it's stretching all the way from Asia Minor through. And so unless you are coming as a minister, uh, as a cleric, as a physician or somebody else, you, you cannot immigrate to the United States from those countries in Asia. So that's part of it. What happens, if you want to know the demise of the law, when it first goes into effect, really, at, uh, I think it's uh, 1919 when the immigration, re it, they find that there are only like 1,500 people who fail the test. And, and it's one of these moments where, okay, if you, what has happened in Europe, elementary school has expanded a bit. So even Italians are coming in with some basic reading. And particularly if you're looking at Jewish immigration from the Pale of Settlement. So who's reading the Torah? And what is Yiddish? So you're looking at a largely literate population coming in. So this does not work. It doesn't do the trick. And Farsworth Hall then goes to what he's always wanted, and that is an overall limit on the number of people coming in. And by this time, Henry Cabot Lodge is pretty sick of the deal. And, and he, he's, he's, he's retiring, from, uh, retiring from the Senate. And there's somebody else who's uh, Prescott Gardner, I believe. And uh, uh, Isabel Stewart Gardner's nephew is in Congress. And he takes over the cause. Post-war, and it's a good time to look for immigration restriction because post-war is return to normalcy, race, radicalism, and immigration. Two images. Uh, this is a Wall Street bombing in 1920. Now, you know the 1919, 1920 with the Palmer raids, the anarchist bombings, the, uh, the bomb left on uh, Attorney General Palmer's porch uh, that blew up. And so there's a wholesale roundup of red radicals brought in. Uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, Range Free, Massachusetts. This is constantly in the news. And the other thing that's making life even worse is that there's a post-war recession. The war is over. The businesses are... Draw. There's been a steel strike, so the United States seems to be in sort of chaos. Let me give you one more image. Uh, that's Cleveland, Ohio, May 1st, 1919, the May Day riots in Cleveland. We, it's not only the Cuyahoga River that's going to be having an anniversary. This is having uh, its anniversary, this 100th anniversary this year. Uh, and this was led by uh, Charles Ruthenberg, socialist who became the first secretary of the American Communist Party. Uh, Ruthenberg, by the way, for trivia is a Clevelander born to German parents who was buried in the Kremlin Wall. And they round them up, and the Russian Reds, the Soviet Ark, the, uh, the ship Buford, they're all packed on, they're deported. Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, all the Reds are on this, and they're shipped over to the Soviet Union. Deportation. And there are advocacy groups. I don't know how many of you have seen this picture. This, this is uh, iconic in the worst way. This is Pennsylvania Avenue. Ku Klux Klan is basically, the first one is, is almost extinguished, if you will, under President Grant's regime. The second one with the book, The Klansman and then Birth of a Nation, the Klan rises again, Stone Mountain, Georgia. And, and its, re its real headquarters is in Indiana. And, and it's, it's, it's quasi Lions Club fraternal organization and quasi, quasi terrorist organization. And they're, they're essential is they are anti-immigrant, they're anti-Jew, they're anti-Catholic, they're anti-black. So they're, they're trying to return to what America was supposed to be. And in Detroit, Michigan, Dearborn, Michigan, Henry Ford is publishing the Dearborn Independent, which has one issue that goes international called the International Jew. And then he continues, and, and Ford finally in 1927 recants. So you have this incredible pressure. And, and if you're looking at where the population movement is coming from, we'll get into this. It is in that area, uh, east, the eastern part of Germany, that eastern section between what we now know as the Soviet Union and Germany. There's chaos there between the white and red armies as Poland is being created, and the Jews are caught in the middle of this. So surprisingly, the literate immigrants, here we go, about 1,400. By 1920, 52,000 were arriving, uh, immigrants were arriving every month at Ellis Island. There's so many ships coming in, they had to divert some of them to Boston to offload. So you've got all this coming on, and the immigration restrictionists are looking at this. 
And uh, substantially Italian and Jewish immigration is coming in at that point. So uh, Albert Johnson, uh, who's from the uh, state of Washington, representative of the state of Washington, comes up with the Emergency Quota Act in 1921. You can read it, but I've, uh, basically it sets an overall limit, and that limit is then parceled out by quota, by percentage of population of this nationality or ethnic group living in the United States in the 1910 census. So they've limited it to 310,000 people. The story behind this is just absolutely incredible. The act is passed in May. It becomes operative in June. Nobody has learned how to administrate it. Nobody has told the steamship companies. Nobody has instructed the consular service. So it, there's absolute chaos going on. Shipping companies know that they're not going to be able to land more than X number of Slovenians. Okay? So the question is, which ship gets out of the dock first and gets to quarantine first and gets it? So they're in a competition to bring people in. Uh, people are turned back, they're left on ships. Uh, it takes a long time to straighten it out. It is, it, is, it, is, it is an act that is made without forethought at all. And eventually, the group that straightens this out is, are the shipping companies, because they have the most to lose. And they're doing all this through cable, telegram, and whatever else, trying to work out how many Italians have arrived so far, how many more are in the quota, how many can we bring over. Uh, so, <laughs> I won't go any further with that. I love the hairstyle. And what I mentioned earlier, what you're looking at is a reconfigured Europe. This is Europe before the war and Europe after the war. I don't know how many of you saw, heard Robert Gerwarth speak here at our Ubalodi lecture, who basically talked about the fact that World War I did not end in 1918, the Treaty of Versailles. It was in 1918, but if you're looking at Anatolia, if you're looking at Eastern Europe, there were conflicts, displacements, murders, chaos, five million more people dying in those areas until 1923. And you had population exchanges. In Turkey, eventually, all the Greeks in Turkey were sent to Greece, and all the Turks remaining in Greece were sent to Turkey. So there was a lot of nationalism rising at this point. And so that's what's encumbering this. And so the question is, if you're a Slovak and you're living now in Hungary because it was kind of mixed up, are you a Hungarian or Slovak? Which quota do you go under? How are you identified? That act was supposed to be temporary. It was renewed for two more years. And in 1924, and this is the Johnson-Reed Act, Johnson's added again. They pass a permanent law. Second Quota Act, you can read the numbers as well as I can. This is a President uh, Coolidge signing it in at the White House. Now, the fact that uh, General Pershing is there doesn't mean he has anything to do with immigration because he was also signing a military appropriations bill the same day. Uh, so that's a joint program. Uh, and there's, there's an interesting story here because the initial impetus was to do the quota, 165,000 people total, based on the percentage of those people in the 1890 census. Okay, in 1890, there weren't many Italians, Jewish population from Eastern Europe hadn't really gotten robust. Uh, so this was blatantly skewed. And, and so the, the question was, how could you get around this? Because the House passed it initially, and when it was first before the House, let me give the numbers, uh, the House passed it 323 to 71. And then it went over to the Senate. And, uh, and the Senate was, was, it was problematic because they felt that there were issues here that were just too blatant. So they decided, Reed came up with a system that he'd, he'd heard about from somebody else. And that is, don't base it on the census. Let's figure out what the actual proportion of these people are in the contemporary American population, national origins. And once we get those... Uh, those statistics, those percentages, that's how we'll enforce it. So America will always stay the same percentage of what it is, year after year after year. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, uh, and the, they don't do that until 1929, and they, they drop it to 154,000 total. Now, ladies and gentlemen, neither of these acts has quotas for the Western Hemisphere. Western Hemisphere does not get a quota until 1965. So why do we not regulate immigration 
from Canada, Mexico, and Latin America. A, because the Monroe Doctrine, and this is our hemisphere, that's one argument. B, because when these acts were being discussed, Mexican labor, 50,000 Mexicans came over the border be between 1900 and 1910. Between 1910 and 1920, I believe, don't quote me on this, the number's 500,000. There's a revolution going on in Mexico. The businesses and so forth in the Southwest and the West had gotten used to transient Mexican labor, and they did not want that impeded. They did put a head tax on Mexicans at $10 a piece, but they left that gate open. That has been a traditionally open gate for a long time, until 1965. Some of you may remember, if I get out of my time frame here, the Bracero program. During World War II, when labor was short, the Bracero program basically invited Mexicans to come over, work, go home, that was continued right into the Kennedy administration. So there are other little historical threads here, but let me uh, stay where I am. So you signed that, here are the quotas. Let me move out of your way. Great Britain and Northern Ireland, 34,000. Italy, 3,845. Now the only people who could come outside of the quota were the wives and children of American citizens. So there was still family reunification, but if you're reunifying your family, they were counted against the quota, unless you were an American citizen. The other thing this act did is it basically barred anybody coming who was ineligible for citizenship. That meant the Japanese could no longer come, which did not sit well with the Japanese. And some historians argue that this is part of a dissatisfaction the Japanese Empire had with the United States. But you can see how these are worked out. Here we go. This chart is really quite good. The, uh, you, can see North, you can see the percentage of Northern and Western Europe shrinking, and then after the act, growing. So the engineering was successful. Oops. Okay, so you know about the quota, and when I was talking to Michael Barron before, and he, you know, I said I was going to do some counter, what, would Cleve, what, what did this do to Cleveland? Uh, and this is speculative. Counterfactual history is always speculative because there are too many things going on. Let's look at Cleveland first. Uh, Cleveland at the time of the uh, 1920s, this is during the First World War. This is a very famous poster. It hangs in the Smithsonian. We have copies at the Western Reserve Historical Society. Uh, the young person speaking to the old, uh, telling the young, uh, his parents to come to school and learn English, learn the language of America. And in 1916, the Shakespeare Garden is started, but the concept of the cultural gardens is started in 1926. By Jenny Zwick, Charles Wolfram, and Leo Weidenthal. And we want to explore that a little bit further. Cleveland, in the years after the Civil War, particularly after 1880, begins to absorb a lot of Southern and Eastern European immigrants uh, and Italians. I mean, that's the little Italy's roots, big Italy's roots are there. The old German-Jewish community is here, but the community from Eastern Europe really begins to grow after the first pogroms in the 1880s, and, and that begins to expand. There's a lot of Jewish migration from New York to Cleveland as well. Slovaks, Slovenes. Uh, Slovak women working in a World War I factory. This is a good book on these groups. Uh, I'm not selling books here. There's nothing on a table outside. Uh, this is a picture on Woodland Avenue at the time when that area was growing. So, so we were beginning to get those same groups. And we were also getting internal migration. So Cleveland's African-American population, you'll see the stats later. Uh, these, these are migrants from the south in the lower Woodland neighborhood around 1910. And that's Carl and Louis Stokes as young men. So if we're looking at Cleveland over time, you can see the numbers. I think the one that's critical for me, that says 30%, these are foreign born. If you take foreign born, foreign born children, it's two thirds of the city at that point. So first and second generation. So this looks like New York. We're outside. There are five major cities, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, that, that are on this line. It's, you know, now with our, our Pacific Rim immigration, we're looking at Los Angeles and other cities there. 
uh, but this is the, the story at this point. Uh, Cleveland's percentage now, in terms of foreign born within the city, is around 5%. That's about it. African Americans in Cleveland, and there's some interesting figures here. You can see the numbers jump between 1900 and 1920. The reason for that is the war is on, industry is booming, and where are you going to get workers when immigration from Europe is largely impeded? So African Americans are pushed out by persecution, by Jim Crow, and they're moving as the first great migration up to a city like Cleveland. So it's a great flow. And you'll also see it bump up during the 1920s. And what does that mean? That means that the labor flow from Europe is being slowed down. So the labor flow, not only of African Americans, but of people from Appalachia and, and let's say the Virginia area also grows. If you look at the growth of Akron, Ohio, in this period in the tire industry, that's when you see this large movement from Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, into Akron, Ohio. So people move for jobs, people move because they're being persecuted. And so when the tap is turned off at one place, it, it comes on in another. Interestingly enough, a lot of the push against against the quota acts initially was from industry because they were looking at a workforce. But industry, according to John Hyam in a wonderful book, uh, uh, which just suddenly escapes me, it's Hyam's masterpiece, uh, Strangers in the Land. Uh, it's, it's worth a read and a lot of this uh, talk is based on that. Basically says that by the 1920s, Industry later, by the mid-1920s, industry was beginning to understand that they could fulfill their labor needs, A, through mechanization, and B, through internal migration of African Americans. So there was, the move was away from pushing against that. One of the great forces in favor of Literacy Act and regulation of immigration was the American Federation of Labor, because this would be competition for skilled labor. So, what we're looking at is Cleveland is robustly growing in the 1920s. 29 is beginning to tail off, but look at, you can look at the number of companies, the value of products, industrial production. So it's a place that, that needs labor. And labor is in the heavy industries. The neighborhoods that we know now are the neighborhoods that were near the industries where the workers lived and they, can, and they could walk to the... So you know, one of the questions we have in the counterfactual, what would have happened to those neighborhoods if the immigration kept. So this is a, near Broadway and Harvard. It's Polish on one side, Slovenian on the other. This is drawn from a census map. You can see the concentrations of different ethnicities in different areas. And by this time, African Americans are largely being sequestered in what is now uh, Cedar Central or out in the area near West 130th Street. There's a small colony there. Uh, so there's a study that was based on census tract data there. So we are an ethnic city, and we're building a lot of things. Uh, ironically, there's, so the, the boom here, this is the terminal tower being built. And uh, so the city has undergoing uh, the, most of the major buildings in downtown Cleveland that we know were built in the 1920s. There's a lot of, it's, it's moribund until the 50s before things get to be built before. So if you're looking at the Huntington Building or the old uh, Union Commerce Bank and the terminal, all this is going on downtown. But the other thing that's going on, which makes the study more complicated, my remarks, a little bit dicey, is we're building suburbs. So the Van Swearingen's are building Terminal Tower to service their suburb in Shaker Heights. So the city is no longer just, it's, it's no longer expanding by annexing their separate sub-communities that are there. And, and so it's not only for people moving to Shaker Heights, a lot of workers building those houses. One of the things you do see during the 20s is when they, the labor flow is restricted, the wages tend to go up. So bricklayers are making six bucks a day or something like that. It really becomes, and you know, as, as I said, this is, uh, this is Garfield High Park Heights, the new Polish suburb. So Garfield Heights, so these inner ring suburbs, some of them, not Cleveland Heights certainly, but if you're looking at Maple Heights, Garfield Heights, if you're looking at Euclid, you're looking at immigrant groups that are moving out of the city and moving out uh, and, and moving into these suburbs. So sometimes when I'm gonna show you some numbers of immigrant groups in the city, uh, we're not counting the ones in the county. Okay, the quota in Cleveland. Okay, looking at population by identity. I searched in our newspaper database under quota. I searched under aliens. 
in, in May and June of 1921, I could find very little in the newspaper about those acts. It's like it never happened. Now, if I were reading La Voce del Popolo Italiano or the Yiddish Welt, I might have found something else, but I couldn't excise it from those. So there's a little story up there. You see, Enforce Act to Restrict Aliens. There it is. This is the plane dealer just after the act comes in. I'll read it to you. Uh, immigration officials began today enforcement of the immigration bill restricting entry of aliens to 3% of the nationals of their country in the United States at the time of the 1910 census. A rush of immigrants was expected during the next two months. And on, on, in case of most countries, the bars, bars would have to be put up long before the end of the year. Only 30% of the total quota of any given country, 20% can be entered each month. So that's another thing that's going on. But there's no screaming headlines saying Cleveland's going to suffer. What's going to happen to our ethnic neighborhoods? Remember the congressional majorities that did this. When that law was passed in 19, when it, the amended law, the House voted 320, uh, 3, 308 to 62 in favor of it, and the Senate voted 69 to 9. Now, one of the few people in the House who voted against it was a young congressman from New York City named Emanuel Seller whose name comes up in 1965 again, because he's still there. Let's close out with that. So these are statistics from the census. They don't show a lot of change. And the problem we have is when you're counting from Austria, who's part of that Austrian count before Austria-Hungary is broken apart? And why are the Poles having their own number there in 1900 when there's no Poland? OK. And it may be because they're doing that ethnic thing at Ellis Island or someplace else, and they're counting those numbers, and they're getting the sense. I don't have an answer for that. But you begin to see the drop, if you look at Italian, large growth, and by 1940, it's beginning to wane. Poland begins to drop as well. Russia, which read Russia, read Jewish, or read Carpatho Russian, don't read Great Russian. And so you're looking at the numbers going up, and then they're, they're dropping down seriously by 1930. Now, I don't know what's happening here. Does that mean suburbanization? I doubt it, even though Cleveland Heights was beginning to see its first Jewish residence. Uh, so that, that, these are open questions, but there is a drop. Yugoslavia drops as well. So it's, it's not immense, but it would have grown, wouldn't it? That's the question. What if? There are things that we have to consider, and I put these up as, as prompts. Local, national, and international economics. Could the 20s continue to have roared? Would there inevitably had been, been a, 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 a depression? a collapse of the US market if we'd allowed immigrants, more immigrants in. I doubt it. I think that still would have occurred. And so I will argue that, that even if we didn't have the Quota Act, by 1929, 1930, the American economy still would have overexpanded. It would have been too much credit. And people would not have come. They would have left. That may have stopped, unless they had to come because their lives were in danger, or unless they wanted to come because their family was already here. That's one of the things the Quota Act makes very difficult, is reuniting families. If you have a large family and the quota is filled, you bring them over one by one. So that's one. Uh, global politics, policies, and persecutions. The of Gerwart's work again, the consequences of World War I. They're still going to go on. There still is going to be chaos between the whites and the reds after the, so at the Bolshevik Revolution. There still is going to be a contretemps between Poland and Russia. There still is going to be the rise, I would argue, of nationalism in Germany because of the Versailles Treaty and the reparations, even though the United States tries to help. I mean, it's, these are all speculative things. So these new nationalisms, Mussolini is already in the seat in Italy, and he's building a nationalism. Ataturk is doing the same thing in, in in uh, Turkey, so I don't know where we're going. The immigrant migration dynamics, this is, what's, this is what sort of pushes against this. Oops. 
we're looking at migration chains. Immigrants or migrants come in chains. Somebody from country A or state A comes and finds a job. They communicate back. The family will come over, friends will come over. Donna Gabaccia has done studies of Italians who have come from one town in Italy. Almost the whole town empties out and ends up in a series of tenement blocks in New York City. So you find this. So I would argue that those migration chains from Italy, from Germany, and Poland might still have continued into the end of the 1920s. There would have been more Poles, more Italians, more Jews coming into Cleveland. Uh, so you have those, and the, the local, the national migration chain, the local, and the, and the family reunification uh, coming in. So there would have been more, but up to a point. But the other thing that makes this compounded is return migration. Would Czechs have gone back to the new Czechoslovak Republic to help build up the homeland now that it was free of the Habsburgs? How many Poles went back to Poland now that they finally had a Poland after the war? How many Italians might have wanted to go, on, go back to Italy uh, because they thought Mussolini? We don't know. We do know that many immigrants came to return. One of the statistics is that one third of all the immigrants who came to the United States uh, between roughly the end of the American Civil War, the 1870s, and 1914 went back or went someplace else. There's a wonderful book out called Round Trip Ticket to America. Basically, that's what the steamship companies made possible. You could, you could buy a ticket, go and work, get enough money, save it, go home, buy the land, and, and live like a lord, as they would say. Several groups did this in extreme. So their, their rates of return immigration have been charged. There are two groups who have the lowest return rates, Jews and Irish. Nothing really to return to. So what you're looking, you're looking at is an exchange. And you know, this new national pride, we finally have a nation that we wanted. I mean, the, one of the agreements for creating Czechoslovakia was signed in Cleveland. So it's, it's a very complex thing. And the other point you have is, what would internal migration happen? So would flows of Appalachians and African Americans to Cleveland have continued to be as robust as they were? And, and if they were, what would the competition for jobs have been? And what would the racial consequences have been? One of the interesting facts that I can only speak about, but not to in any depth, is how people of Southern, Eastern, Central European origin ended up absorbing American racial attitudes. We, we do know in 1919, during the Great Steel Strike of that year, that African Americans who had worked in the mills when the white workers were away came back as strike breakers, and there were battles between them. We do know that in 1863, the draft riots in New York City were basically largely Irish, but the, the targets were African Americans. And so what was the fear? Was it job competition? Was it economic competition? So what would have happened to Cleveland if you had these two confluences coming in at this point? This is speculative. I have no answer for you. And you really had that internal migration, but a Western Hemisphere migration. I don't know if you saw the small numbers about Mexicans. By the 1920s, Cleveland had a small Mexican population. The Mexicans were working their ways up the railroad lines into Chicago, Chicago, Whiting, Indiana. My colleague, uh, John Flores, has just done a wonderful study of, of, uh, of Mexicans in Chicago in the 1920s. It's gotten incredibly good reviews in how they still stayed politically active in terms of Mexican politics while they were in Chicago. They weren't totally divorced from what their heritage. So it, it opens up all of these issues. Uh, but I think in 1930, with the Depression, it would have stopped. And I think the war probably would have gone on and kept it on. So the question is, you know, what happens afterwards? Would we have become more Italian? Yes. Would we have become more Jewish? Yes. Less dependent on internal migration? Probably. Don't know. It depends how the employers would play one group off after another. Uh, would neighborhoods have endured longer? I don't know. Perhaps. But perhaps the new immigrants would have pioneered out to the other neighborhoods, the new Polish settlement or Euclid Avenue. We don't know. The question is transportation, how they would have worked. Would the lack of work in the Depression have strained intergroup relations? Yeah, it would have even though there was a move for inter-ethnic, interracial solidarity that was very much a leftist move at that time to bring everybody together. 
The UAW during the 30s was the one union that had mixed membership of blacks and uh, whites. So there are, there are a lot of wheels in motion here. Uh, would we have started a cultural guard? My thesis is that the reason that Zwick, Weidenthal, and Wolfram started that garden in 26 was yes, there was the example of Shakespeare, but B, the door had just been slammed in the face of groups that people felt were culturally inferior. And I think that was an impetus to create those gardens. Now, uh, Mark Thibault is working on a book on, on the cultural gardens, and he may approach that, and a couple of other people have talked about it. But you know, those gardens are a signifier of, of that, at least in my opinion. Coda, and I'm off, and we have time for questions. Uh, there's one piece of legislation that's not on the agenda tonight, and it's the piece of legislation that hit really changed Cleveland and the United States. It's the Hart Cellar Act of 1965. And Lyndon Baines Johnson is signing it here, and he's sitting on Liberty Island by the Statue of Liberty signing that act. And that still, that created a quota for the Western Hemisphere, created a quota for the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, but it gave no special treatment to any ethnic group. There were the same limits on each country overall. Uh, the quotas were allowed for family reunification, and they also, the, the major thing was if you had a job skill that was not, could not be filled by somebody in the United States, you could get what is now called an H-1B visa. But it didn't discriminate against any particular group. One of the arguments in David Reamer's book called Still the Golden Door is that Congress by the 1960s was composed in substantial part of some of the children of the immigrant groups that had been affected by the quota acts. And, and this was, if you want to use the word, their chance to tip the scale back to even, to, with, to do the right thing and change the wrong thing. Uh, and many people perfectly expected. When Johnson signed this law, he said, no, no, people will not notice this law. This is not the major change. I mean, in between this, uh, there's the 1952 law uh, that codifies American immigration. But he says that, and the expectation is that you're still, the flow is still going to come from wherever it came before. These families will reunify. People will still come from Europe. But Europe's economy is booming in the 60s. Europe is importing immigrants. The Germans are bringing in Turks as Gastarbeiter. And so there's not that much, after re reunification of families, that, that much pressure for people to move out of Europe. The population pressures, the push factors, have moved to other parts of the world. South America, Mexico, the Middle East, the Pacific Rim, India. And, and so this new push factor, that's what changes immigration to where it is today, largely non-European, if you want to use those terms. And that immigration is looked upon by many people of European heritage. This is not like us. But then you can take and fill in the last line by yourself. But this is the law that, that really changes Cleveland. Uh, it changes this campus. It changes everything. Uh, it, is, it is a global law that, that responds to it. Acts, what, what, I think what legislators are ignorant of many instances are the, and, and I'm not a legislator, and I never want to be one. I'll never go there they're ignorant of is, are the dynamics of immigration and how they can change over time, where push factors will change, how pull factors will change, where wars will break out, where persecutions will occur, uh, and how we will deal with those things at our door. Do we need to regulate immigration? Yes, we do. Do we need a reasonable law? Yes, we do. Uh, but this, this is a world in motion. And the other thing we did not talk about, and I'll close out with this, is the technology of moving. It's the steamships, Hop Hamburg America, Hopad Lloyd, Cunard, that made that major movement possible. It's the telegraph and telegram that allowed immigrants to get news of what was happening in the United States, to know that there was a panic in 1907. It wasn't a good time to come. Those means of transportation, those means of communication, have changed remarkably now. And the population pressures on the globe, seven billion of us, are going to put more people in motion all the time. Cleveland will continue to change. I'll leave it with that. Thank you. I did go on, sorry. Do questions right now? Um, if you have a question, why don't you just raise your hand and I'll try to get around to you.
and I'll stay here. How much do you think the eugenics movement influenced these two uh, immigration acts? Uh, very much. The eugenics movement was very strong behind that. that basically, this is the time where we were beginning to sterilize feeble-minded, categorizing people, the moron, idiot, feeble-minded, and so forth, and trying to do selective breeding. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's an integral part. Cold Harbor is an integral part of this movement. Uh, what role, the, in terms of influence, these immigration policies relevant to uh, the imperial uh, nature of the United States in terms of Pax Americana and what the euphemisms around intervention and humanitarian intervention in these euphemisms based on a sphere of influence and a hegemony. Right. How did that impact this and how did it impact the role of nativism and uh, 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 Eurocentric birthright that influenced uh, what she was indicated in terms of eugenics? Because it seems to be a, a, a there were some nebulous uh, 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 justifications well, in, the, in terms of the veneer. But what do you feel is uh, the, uh, the underlying issues around the imperial, uh, imperial hegemony, uh, in intervention, Pax Americana, mm -hmm. and uh, the issues around birthright and nativism that, uh, that reflect in this particular, as a historian, it's it it is it is all it is, it is in a sense it is colonial. It's colonial in in a very broad sense. The Western Hemisphere is excluded from quotas, largely because it's our hemisphere. It's treated that way. Uh, Panama, Colombia, Banana Republics, United Fruit Company, all the way through. So, you know, basically, we have said it's our hemisphere. And in terms of colonialization, the categorization of immigrants by race and ability basically mirrors what you will see in colonial enterprises anywhere else in the world. Who are capable people? Who are people that, quote, unquote, need to be led? Who, who are people that can assimilate? So there's suppositions in this. That the, there's a, a popular book uh, by William Z. Ripley called The Races of, of, of the World, I believe, in the 1880s. And essentially, it categorizes colonial races by who they are and, and not only gives them the, the physiognomy that's supposed to be typical of them, but also classifies what their capabilities are. And so when you get to what's coming out of the Immigration Restriction League, which is the Anglo-Saxon race, basically the conquering race, that's essentially what you're, you're looking at, a Darwinian interpretation of this as well. So that, that's what they're talking And that's what Madison Grant is writing about. He's basically writing about the fact of those quotations there that, that you're losing your racial power if you're Anglo-Saxon by intermarrying with somebody who is not Anglo-Saxon. So he's talking almost about a genetic continuity there. It's prevalent, still prevalent. Yeah. Anti-German hysteria in the U.S. and in Cleveland during and immediately after World War I. Yet a few years later, in these quotas, Germany got the highest quota amount. Can you comment on that? Um, what was going on? I don't know if anybody really thought about that, but they were looking. They they basically had to. The National Origins Act is loaded in in regard to people who have been here longer because they've generated more generations. So it's not just about German immigrants who are resident in the United States, it's about people of German heritage. So if you look at English and generational expansion, if you look at German, the older immigrant groups in German expansion, the quotas, the national origin quotas are always gonna be higher uh, because they have produced more offspring over more generations. That's what the 1890 thing was doing, but that's, that's what the invidious part about the, uh, the national origins thing is because it's, it's basically breaking down the multi-generational ethnic background of the United States. Now, how they handled people who were German in Scandinavia or intermarried, I don't know. That's why it's, they were gonna do it in two years, it took them four years, so it's long. But that's, it's there. And, uh, now, the, the irony about some of this is that one of the first gardens in the cultural gardens, not the first, but one, is the German garden. This is what's like 
10 to 15 years after the end of the war in anti-German hysteria. Okay, next question. John, in your early statistics, you have Jews listed, but when the acts come along, they are done by nation. And how is that figured out, particularly because of the mobility of certain you know, Jews in Europe, but the way they were tracked appeared to be totally different. I, I, I don't, you know, that's, that's a very good question, because I don't know how they counted them unless they were looking at the Ellis Island input when they came in after they were categorizing race, or if they were looking at language, language, language spoken at home is given in the 1910 census. But religion was never a legitimate question when you came in. So there are never statistics for Catholics or Protestants. But that opens the question, is how did they determine the number of Jews in the United States at that point? Was the assumption that everybody who was coming from Russia who spoke Yiddish was Jewish? And did they extrapolate from that? What did they then do about German Jews? Did they count them as Germans or Jews? Where, where does that go? I mean, this is... This throws, the, you know, this throws the monkey wrench in the whole thing because you start these hard categorizations and then you're looking at intermarriage, you're looking at all kinds of mobility. Uh, but they were, they, they, were, they were literally looking for Jews because that was the bete noir at that point. You're, you're looking at the, the uh, activities of the anarchists and so forth that was all blamed on Jews. The Bolsheviks were Jews, so forth and so on. That, that was... And the international Jew, that's what Henry Ford was spewing out at that point. So that, how they constructed those numbers, I don't know. I was amazed to find the one number in a reputable resource about the number of Jews who came in just before the Quota Act was passed. It was, it was a substantial number, and it actually frightened the people in Washington. Now, they probably got that out of the literacy test at that point, because they probably requested a line to read in Yiddish. I'm guessing on that. It's tough. Yes, we have another question. Uh, yes, in one of your earlier slides, you mentioned uh, the the literature mentioned three European races, and nowadays no one seems to really care if you are Polish or Italian or British or German or whatever it is. When did, if you will, whiteness in air quotes coalesce into one unified thing as opposed to Southern European, Jewish, Polish, German, British, whatever it is. Yeah, that, that's, you know, when the Italians became white, when the, uh, the Jews became white, this whole area of white, whiteness studies, uh, the scholars, now David Rodiger is one of the scholars who works on right, whiteness studies, and that, that posits the fact that these immigrants who were unassimilable, uh, particularly during the World War II period, became part of, of the war effort. And, but the other issue is that they they were defined as white to offset the increasing prejudice against black. Or did they define themselves or were they defined in, in that way? Uh, I, it's not good scientific historical evidence, but if you look at a lot of the old popular movies during World War II, uh, catch the names of some of the, uh, the characters and, and they will have ethnic last names and they're all fighting together. And the only person you won't see fighting with them is the African American because he's off in a segregated unit someplace. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of argument in academia about the validity of whiteness studies. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, argues against them, basically saying that people still retain their identities. And, and I see that with the burgeoning issue of genealogy. I was, a lot of identity recovery began in the 1960s. I think a lot of white identity recovery followed on African Americans saying that we are of African ancestry, and we're going to recapture our identity. And so that's when you begin to see this, you know, roots is, is something that sparks a larger cognizance of identity. Uh, so it cuts both ways, and, and we could go to Germany now and see what Angela, Angela Merkel is dealing with in terms of Germans feeling totally European. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite there in some parts of former Eastern Germany yet. Oh, okay. I thought this was still working. Is it? Am I on? Okay. Am I better? Yeah. Uh, could you draw a line to today, please? <laughs> yeah, which I guess the line I will draw uh, without trying to be political is that, that fear is a good way to power. 
because that's what was being inculcated by the eugenicists. That's what was being inculcated by the racists. That was the basis of the quota acts that America would cease to be America if these people who were different were allowed in. Now, you can draw your own line from that, but a lot of people have used fear for power. It's, it's, it's a constant in every history that, that you read. I find it hugely troubling. John, I have a question. Yeah. Um, bottom line, if it hadn't been for immigration restrictions, would Northeast Ohio have larger population today than it does? No. I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm basically looking at a, a lot of things that, that have occurred since. And you know, again, you know, the, the one point we're talking about is change that one law and everything else that happens globally changes. Decolonialization changes, okay? All, all these things, labor markets, transportation, shipment of goods from elsewhere, natural resources. I think all that would have proceeded, Michael. And, and, and the question, you know, our population loss here is partially the deindustrialization of, of, of the city. And so, you know, we may have had a larger city at one point, uh, but deindustrialization probably still would have occurred. That's, counterfactual history is so, so interesting, <clears throat> uh, but they're so, you know, it's, 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 it's the world's biggest chessboard. Because as somebody once told me, a non-historian said, you know, history is, is the story of millions if not billions of people over time, all their stories weaving together, intersecting and creating the present. And so the typical sci-fi thing is you move one person out, what happens to all the rest? What's the key pin? Yes, um, when did the whites start coming together to oppose the other, like, which, because I know the Irish, they were white too, but they were treated like dirt. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, uh, you know, no, no, no Irish need apply that standard that standard talk. The, the interesting thing about uh, that, and we're going to get into whiteness studies, one of the, men, one of the leaders of the anti-Chinese movement in uh, California was a man named Dennis Kearney, Irish-American. And so Dennis Kearney was the epitome of the white man in California vis-a-vis -vis the Chinaman. And by the late 19th century, you know, Irish began to, to assimilate. Uh, again, the, we're looking at major individual stories and uh, and, and then and when we get into group speak to talk about the Poles or the Irish or the Jews, we, we, we get into dicey territory at times. Uh, the Germans, too, who were called the Dutch, became prosperous citizens and, and were welcomed in until World War I when they became the ultimate other as, as an enemy and were vilified. Uh, you know, and this, you know, the Poles are now in, Ita Ita being Italian is now cool, right? Uh, supposedly, uh, and Italians were out, and, and now that's it. It's, it's difficult to answer that. And you could say, well, we suffered that too, or we suffered that too, and they were persecuted too. But I think what we need to do, look is the mechanisms and understand the mechanisms over time and how they work and what the reaction is. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Um, we're going to move now into a very brief, is Lynn here? Good, <laughs> nice to see you. Um, this is Lynn Tremont, and she's going to give just a very brief talk about where we're at right now in terms of immigration policy. Uh, very brief, less than five minutes. Hi everybody, my name's Lynn Tremonti. I'm with the Ohio Immigrant Alliance. Um, we are a statewide organization, advocacy group that is trying to make Ohio a more welcoming place for immigrants. And we've got some good friends here in the audience who work with us in that goal. Um, I spent about 10 years in DC working in policy and, and advocacy there in Congress. And so what I just wanted to talk about is more contemporary. Um, and I wanted to start out by saying that nobody believes that the current immigration laws work. They don't work for immigrants, they don't work for employers, they don't work for um, the law enforcers. Um, but what we're seeing now is that there's, there is a lot of um, 
authority that the executive branch has in deciding how they enforce this broken set of laws. And so you're seeing a very dramatic change from the previous administration to now. And I want to take a spotlight on a group of people who are both deportable and have the right to stay here. Um, there are people who um, came out here a long time ago. Um, they could have entered with a visa. They could have entered without inspection crossing the border. Um, but they ended up building lives here and um, settling down, maybe marrying an American citizen, having children here. Um, and based on certain factors, hardship, if perhaps they had a child with Down syndrome who also had heart defects and wouldn't be able to get treatment in their home country, um, for various reasons they were given a work permit and allowed to stay under an order of supervision. Um, Ohio has many people in this situation. And unfortunately, they're in that limbo status where they're both deportable, deportable, but also if the administration says that they can stay, then they can stay. And so under um, a previous administrations, tens of thousands of Ohioans were allowed to stay under these orders of supervision. And then when Trump came into power, I'm sorry, office, um, he said, you know, he had told us that he was going to, you know, get rid of all the bad people or whatever and focus on criminals. But it was so much easier to just go through their list of people that they already had. They knew where they were. They knew their addresses and say, you come in, come in early for, you know, pe these people with orders of supervision have meetings every year with ICE. Come in early for your meeting. Okay, Jesus, it's, you know, I'm sorry. I know you've been here for 20 years, but you got to go. And so the goal was just to get rid of as many people who had already been through the court process so that they could do it as quickly as possible. Um, and it didn't matter, it honestly didn't matter whether they had the kid with the congenital heart defect who could, couldn't get the treatment in Morocco. It didn't matter if they had four American kids and they were the primary caretaker of, of those kids. Um, <clears throat> it just didn't matter. And so... Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of broken hearts and a lot of broken families in Ohio. And um, the headlines, of course, have been at the border and about um, refugees from Central America coming here with children. And, you know, why are they doing that? What are they fleeing? What do we do with them when they get here? Um, and there's been a beautiful humanitarian response from Americans who don't quite get exactly what's happening, but they, they know that there's something there and that, that can't be... You know, our, our attitude can't be to completely close our borders to people in need. Um, but what maybe you don't know is that there's kids in Ohio tonight who are missing their moms and dads. There are kids who are crying. There are kids who are going through the worst traumatic experience. Um, there are kids who have killed themselves. An 11-year-old girl in um, Painesville killed herself a couple years ago after her father was deported. And if you want to look that up, Connie Schultz wrote a column about that. So. Just remember, this is happening in our, in our own backyard, too. Um, again, we do need to fix the immigration laws. I'm a big proponent of that. But bef you know, until Congress gets the will to do that, um, there are so many things that we're doing right now that are really um, just, it's, you would be shocked to know what's happening. I guess one more last thing I'll talk about is the Mauritanians. Um, there are another, this is another group of people who have been living here on orders of supervision for 20 years. Um, they fled Mauritania genocide in the early 1990s. Many of them got asylum and now have green cards and citizenship. Many lost their cases because they had bad lawyers or they um, were confused about how to bring a good case, not because they weren't refugees. So they had orders of supervision. Um, now they're being deported, and when they're deported, they're from a, a African, the African ethnic group, and the ruling ethnic group is lighter-skinned Berber Arab Moors. Um, so when they're deported, they're stateless again. It's a crime to be in Mauritania without a document. They're put in jail. The jails are torture. Um, and they stay there until their family member pays a bribe to get them out, and then they immediately flee. I only know of one man who still lives in Mauritania who's been deported. There have been about 100 deported. Everybody else is trying to get their refugees again. They're trying to get somewhere else. Um, Ohio has the largest number of Mauritanians in the US. And um, I've been working with them and, and a lot of leaders in Columbus and Cincinnati 
to try to stop these deportations of, of real refugees. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about any of this work or getting involved in any way, um, I have cards. I have a, like you can sign up here. Um, it's the Ohio Immigrant Alliance on Facebook. Um, and just thank you for your time and have a good night.